such a pleasure to be uh, in conversation with you, uh, Mr. Lamba. Uh, Anil. Anil, Anil, Anil. Absolutely, Anil. <laughs> yeah. But before we get started, and you did hear her, uh, you did hear Pooja talk about how he's uh, a doctorate in taxation. Now, that sounds like a really interesting thing, right? I mean, think about it. If you had a doctor who was a taxidermist, that would be a very dangerous thing. <laughs> but I want to ask, start by asking you a question. How many of, if you were to rate your financial intelligence on a scale of 1 to 10, okay, your awareness of finance, your understanding of finance on a scale from 1 to 10, uh, how many of you would say you are below 5? Super. And how many of you, put your hands down, and how many of you would say you're dishonest? <laughs> okay, the rest of you I'm guessing, but never mind. But Anil, it's such an interesting thing to be talking about, romancing the balance sheet. Tell us a little bit about how did the idea for this book start? Where did it all begin? I think while <clears throat> you were addressing some time back, you said everybody has a book in them. Uh, that statement, I think, has different uh, meanings for different people. I didn't know, but probably there was a book in me somewhere. You know, I, when I passed out as a CA, I started practicing day one without working anywhere. And coincidentally, we won't go into that, some teaching opportunities came and I thoroughly enjoyed it. So that became kind of a, uh, a, a passion and then a hobby and then a, eventually took over everything that I was doing. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is uh, initial teaching were in B schools and then some corporate started inviting and then you realize <clears throat> how little the world understands of this subject. You know, when you are a fresh pass out, you think you have learned the subject now, the world knows it before you. And then one program going on and some really successful industrialist attending and then at the end of the program he comes back and says, you know, I wish I knew this 20 years back, my life would have been different. You first attribute it to ultra modesty and then you realize perhaps it's an aberration. But then another person tells you, another one tells you, another one tells you. And then you realize that at that level, if you don't understand the subject, the ultimate price is paid. Companies have shut down due to, uh, it's, it's a known undisputed fact that over 90 to 95 percent business failures in the world are attributed to bad finance management. Uh, if, if somebody's product is faulty and therefore the company shuts down, understandable. If, if the product is fine but the marketing was faulty, understandable. If everything was fine and they went into things like labor problems, understandable. But when everything is okay, and why did the company shut down? Because of financial mismanagement. And why does that happen? Not because the finance departments are weak, mind you. Because funnily, my first message within any organization is, very little finance management happens in the finance department. In fact, if somebody can be called as a non-finance person, it is the person who calls himself or herself a finance person. Because the finance professionals are not there when finance management is happening. <laughs> Finance management or mismanagement happens 24 by 7 in the actions of every individual. So, so since this is so important, since people don't realize, if you're a salesperson, you think my job is selling. It's not merely selling. It's selling in a financially intelligent way. Production should happen in a financially intelligent way. Because people don't realize this, the price paid is tremendous. Or on the flip side, if I can communicate this to more and more people, you know, when you do a training program sitting with 30 people in a room, you start feeling, I wish there were 30,000 people over here. How can you take your message to larger audiences? And therefore, I, deep down probably one felt the one way of doing that is writing a book. But being a lazy person by temperament, I used to teach because I used to like it. If it felt like work, I would never have done it. So one day I got some chicken pox and I was grounded for 10 days. And then I had nothing to do, so I started putting things down and that's how Romancing the Balance Sheet was born. <laughs> and then the next book and the next book and so on. Wow. So just imagine, it's <coughs> actually, you know, something goes wrong, you're bedridden and, <laughs> and that could lead to something as nice as a book that's <laughs> gone on to do extremely well. And I must yes. tell you this, Anil, um, I do some work with, with business leaders as a coach and I've, I'm amazed 
at how so many of these potential CEOs or leaders aren't quite as good as they should be in finance. And one of the things that I've done is, of course, to refer them to the book that Anil has written, because I think it's a great way to get people to understand the basics. Um, and I think one of the bigger messages I've taken away from your book is that it's not, it's not as if the finance person is responsible for finance. It's everybody's responsibility to understand finance. Why does this understanding take so much time for people to, you know, to kind of realize? You know, even today, I find uh, people who spend their lifetime saying, I'm a non-finance person, and proudly so, sometimes they say so. I don't know why, why they, they should be ashamed of it. Uh, you're addressing the senior most leadership team in a company. They spent a lifetime saying, I'm a non-finance person. It takes less than 30 minutes into a program for there to be a 180 degree transformation from saying, this is not my job to think this is exactly my job. Everything else can be handled by others. So I don't know why it's such a truism. It takes probably just one or two statements to suddenly the light to come up. But, but because people don't realize that and because I seem to be the one person who spread this message, like I said, the price paid is too heavy, too heavy. Because yep. when companies shut down, what does it mean? I mean, it's easy to say this company shut down. Jobs are lost, vendors lose money, shareholders lose money, entrepreneurs come to the you know, streets. So, so I think it's too heavy a price to pay. But is there something uh, about finance which makes people feel almost scared of it? And I'm just trying to yeah. understand why is it that intelligent people don't get this right? It, uh, it's not, you know, like uh, you've explained, it's not rocket science, but what, what happens? You know, finance people are terrible at marketing. If marketing guys are bad at finance, finance guys are bad at marketing. We haven't marketed the subject well. We made it appear that by, by we, I mean the teachers and the people who brought up the curriculum. You made it appear like such a difficult subject, like such a boring subject. And people perceive it to be difficult and boring and they stay away from it. Whereas I think uh, one of the most fascinating subjects is finance. When somebody says, you know, it might be boring, my answer is, listen, damn it, I'm talking about money. How can money be boring? You know, one of the most interesting things in life is that. But the perception, I think, is wrong and, and therefore people stay away and then uh, all the these problems happen. And if you were to share with this audience, what are the two or three fundamental things everybody needs to understand about finance? Um, what would those two or three things be so that they take away and say, okay, something that I know I should be aware of? Since my time is mainly spent on the business side, even personal finance is very important, but on the business side, number one, lots of people think that business is about generating top lines, whereas business is all about bottom line. Now, the startup culture is again very, very responsible for that. Number two, what you must understand is that just because your business makes profit doesn't mean you have arrived. Profit and money have got no connection between each other. So if your business makes a profit, you have one half the battle. The other half is in the ability to manage cash flows. And again, what they don't understand. Third thing is people don't understand a very, very important concept called cost of capital. And there, the, uh, another misconception they have is that owner's money is free. Whereas owner's money is not only not free, it is probably the most expensive source of money available. There are many such things, Prakash. And, and, and the net result is either there is ignorance or they carry wrong perceptions. Like owner's money being free because guys, business has started with only one objective to make money for the owner. People think debt is expensive. When they find business can't afford debt, they say, what do we do? Let's invest equity. Damn it, if your business can't afford debt, it definitely can't afford equity. So many, many such, more such no. things. But you know, three pretty powerful lessons for anybody who's in business. It's not only about top line, it's about bottom lines, cash flows matter. And remember, cost of capital. So if there's nothing else, I think three pretty powerful lessons to try and take away. Um, Anil, I want to take you back perhaps to your early life and tell us 
when was the first time that you actually learned something about money or a lesson from your childhood or early life where you learned something about money and you said, wow, this is something that, you know, that I should remember or I should be careful about? I, I don't think any such instances happened because, uh, you know, when people say let the kids decide what they want to do in life, at that age, kids don't even know. Like, for example, I did CA because my brother pushed me towards it. I didn't know, didn't even know what CA stands for. So you discover after passing out, after learn, even when you learn the subject, you don't know the importance of what you have learned till you. So every day is a, is a process of discovery. So I, for one, hadn't earned a penny till I started practicing as a CA. So there was no question of learning lessons. The first time I invested in stocks was after as a practicing CA. And then you discover what is this world about stock market. Even the CA course doesn't teach you how to go about it. They give you very, very strong fundamentals, but they don't teach you st stuff like how to invest in shares and other things. But, but if you have the time, I must share a little story over here. I've, I've never, I, I, I'm not a stock broker. I don't advise on shares, even though I write a lot. I have a book on that called Flirting with Stocks. Uh, but share market has always been a fascination for me. I think, I think it's a national duty for everybody to invest in shares. And at one time, I used to run a stock market game, a very successful game, way before the money controls of the world started these mock stock exchanges. We used to run this game played with imaginary money, trying to teach the country how to invest in stocks. And Business India later on became a partner and we took it city by city all over the country. Now. Having said that, I don't make money advising people on shares and, and so on, but we did do one activity. I had a friend who was a sub broker when I was a brand new CA. Now, here's an interesting combination that came together. This friend of mine was a sub broker, a, a cerebral kind of a guy. You ask him something, he'll give you lots of data, facts. It was a pleasure to talk to him. This guy, I was a chartered accountant and I think I was the first CA in town to own a PC. We didn't know what to do with it, but we had a PC in office. We used to play games on it. These three things came together. One day an idea came to us, why don't we start a portfolio management service, probably the first of its kind then, on a subscription basis. And you know, join our uh, portfolio management scheme, pay us a little fee, and we will give you personalized, tax-linked investment advice. Personalized because I had a PC, <laughs> you know, database could throw up so I could, uh, if you own the shares, you'll get a phone call saying, I think you should get out and it doesn't have to go to everybody. Tax link because one of us was a chartered accountant, so we could connect it, you know, maybe you should wait another month, you'll get a little less price, but it'll be long term capital gain instead of short term and so on. So this friend of mine used to come out with a newsletter for what shares to buy for selling individually and for buying was common to everybody. And those days, this friend used to recommend a share called Mazda Industries. Mazda Leasing and then Mazda Industries. It was selling for about 10, 15 rupees and it was a tip to go up to 100. So we told all our clients buy Mazda. We used to not only preach, we used to practice what we preach. So we told people to buy, we bought ourselves. Next newsletter, Mazda had gone up to 25. Said, buy, buy, 100, it'll go to 100. Next newsletter, it went up to 30, 40. And then one of the stock market crashes came. And when a stock market crashes, you know, everything crashes, whether it deserves to crash or not. So good old Mazda settled at some 5 or 7 rupees. We realized this is not a cup of tea. We sold the company, got out of that activity. But then since we had Mazda in a portfolio, as a routine matter, we used to follow what's happening to the share. For the next two, three years, this Mazda continued at 7, 8, 5, 7, 5, 7 rupees. One day, we're glancing through the portfolio valuation and you suddenly see a spike. Mazda from 7 rupees jumped up to 9 rupees. And the following day, it became 10, 11. The following day, it became some 13. The next day, it became 15. So what the hell is happening with Mazda? Suddenly there's a movement. And the following day, you receive a letter from the company saying we have a rights issue, offering a 10 rupee share for 10 bucks. So you put two and two together. Okay, this looks like rigging. 
going on by the company. If they have a rights issue, selling a 10 rupee share for 10, who's going to buy it if the market price is 7? So the management is rigging it up. And then uh, natural reaction is you tear that rights offer and throw it in the dustbin. Rights issue got over and Mazda went up to 20 and then to 25, 30, 35, 40, 45. I said, what the hell is going on? I'm now telling you the price we pay when we go by assumptions. We don't bother to find facts. At 40, 45, there was a little dip. So we said, listen, we've recovered kind of all the holding costs, etc. Let's sell. Sold half the holdings. Mazda started going up again. 45, 50, 55, 60, 70, 75. And then a little more dip came. We said, now let's not be greedy. Sold the rest of them. Recovered all the investments and then Mazda continued to rise. Went up to 100, 150, 200, 300, 400, went up to 1500. And the thing we didn't bother to find out was it went up because Mr. Harshad Mehta had bought into uh, Mazda. <laughs> so such interesting, fascinating things happen in the stock market. And only if you stay invested will these, you know, Wonderful opportunities to make money come in. You can't get into the stock market and expect something like this to happen. So if every if people are invested in the stocks, every now and then this kind of a thing will happen. Interesting, <clears throat> and I'm sure many people here are wondering what's today's Mazda. Yeah, which, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, so do you, this whole idea of you know, <laughs> sorry, Adani and Adani, <laughs> <laughs> that that which shall not be named. <laughs> yeah, tell yeah. me. Um, as you look, if there was to be, uh, you know, knowing what you know now and with all that you've learned, what advice would you have for 21-year-old Anil Lamba when it comes to money and finance? What do you wish you knew at that stage? I wish I knew what I'm teaching through my books better then. I wish people understand that it is very, very important to start investing early. I wish everybody understand that a significant portion of your investment should be in stocks. And therefore, before you do that, learn the rudiments, learn how the stock market functions. Don't do it by ignorance. But if you do that, I wish I understood <coughs> that power of compounding. I wish I understood the kind of toll inflation can take on your investments. And then if you put your money in something like an FD, Probably inflation is invariably ahead of what you are earning and your, your investment is actually deteriorating year after year after. So many things are there, Prakash. Lots to learn. Lots to learn. We've got a couple of minutes. So if there's a question from the audience, something that you want to ask Mr. Lamba, not about stock picks, but anything else. Yeah, yeah Anurag. One of the things is post COVID, people are investing into real estate a lot more because the quality of spaces, Stability. second homes. <coughs> Robin is there and he, you know, convinced the whole hall in Gurgaon not to invest in crypto. What are the <laughs> things not to do? We pretty much know what to do, but all the things which seem okay but not to do. Yeah, crypto is one thing even I've never advised, but for not for any other reason, but for the fact that I don't understand what's happening over there. Crypto is beyond me. But I feel real estate has an important role to play in your portfolio. Portfolio should be a balanced one. Uh, even a certain portion of gold, even though I hate gold as an investment, but a certain portion of gold which is a hedge for investments. If one has a certain amount of investment in stocks, a certain amount in real estate, a little bit in gold, and the rest of it can be divided into multiple other things, tax saving investments and so on. I think it's a balanced portfolio. And that that will probably hold you in good stead. I'm asking this is, hmm. we're doing a cover, maybe two, three issues. Uska working title is Bharat Ka Capital. There are angel investors from Indore, from Raipur, these are still bigger, from even smaller towns that are investing into funds, which are investing into startups, and they've got spectacular exits and returns. So is it advisable to invest in startups? For example, somebody who has a shop 
and who makes two, three crores of profit every year. He was traditionally doing real estate, gold, but has started to invest in these startups because. I think What's startup is too too uh, broad a canvas to you know because each startup is different. The skill lies in your ability to look into the future yeah, and the yeah, the prof. I I don't think anyone can really gauge with or say with guarantee that this particular startup is going to be a success. There are plenty of mistakes to be made, and therefore logic as it is is a one out of ten succeeds is good enough. So your portfolio has to be distributed over many. It has served a lot of people very well, but I think right now it's become too much of a fad. There are too many people doing this, so I'm not sure how how attractive or profitable so far uh, it will it'll be anymore. But it still lies in your ability to gauge. I am I am on the uh, a few incubation funds myself, and we talk to a lot of entrepreneurs on a regular basis. Uh, when they come there the pitch is so short unless you devote a lot of time studying their business model you can't sit and listen to somebody for 10 minutes half an hour and and then gauge what's going to happen and and either you should know so much about the industry so much about if you are an expert from their industry probably one or you may be able to pick but otherwise i think there are too many you know for every unicorn that we read about There are probably ten thousand others which have failed, about which nobody writes about. And and my belief is, since most business failures happen due to financial mismanagement, here also the same thing happens. You may have a wonderful idea. If those guys don't understand how important is finance management, they will still fail. So, and the problem is at that stage in a startup's uh, phase. they are so involved with the technology and which is fine they are so you know they've come out with something earth shaking and then they want they are busy with fundraising they are busy with marketing if you tell them finance management that is the furthest away from their minds and even if they want to they don't have the money right now so priority the money goes somewhere else so i think this is again a deep rooted thing so financial mismanagement will affect or must have must be the cause of many startups failing that that actually land a failing great thanks so much uh, anil for your time and i'm not here to give you a stock tip or give you investment advice on whether it should be startups or crypto or real estate but i have a simple investment advice for you both his books are available outside okay balance uh, romancing the balance sheet and flirting with stocks If you want something simple to understand, but which can change your life, go pick up those books. And you know what? Anil doesn't sign checks easily, but he signed this book one pretty quickly. Thanks so much, Anil, for your time.